Okay, thank you for inviting me. <laughs> Hi. Uh, so, what I want to talk about in this course is about consciousness. Maybe um, tell everyone who you are a little bit. Oh, I'm a fallen monk, renegade monk. Uh, from the Tibetan Buddhist tradition, who became a boring professor in a, a fairly good college in America. And uh, I teach uh, Buddhism and uh, Buddhist philosophy, and I teach a course on consciousness in collaboration with a friend from the philosophy department who is also in cognitive science. So uh, I'm going to try to reproduce some of the things that I do in that course. It's going to be a little bit difficult because in that course I have the help of my friend who really knows what he's talking about. <laughs> and so... Uh, I'm a friend who knows what he's talking about. <laughs> <laughs> something else. <laughs> And so this is what I'm going to try to do. Now, obviously, uh, we have only four or five weeks, and so I'm going to shorten the course. And also, there is been a lot of material on cognitive science that I will not be really able to talk about. But I hope that uh, the course will make sense to you if you are really interested in consciousness. Now. What I'm going to try to do in this course is to try to understand what, how can modern Buddhists think about consciousness in this present moment, given the developments in all the modern mind science. So I'm not going to talk about what the Buddhist view of consciousness is. There are many views of Buddha, of, about consciousness in Buddhism. What I'm going to talk about is how can we understand what Buddhists might be able to say in relation to all these developments that are taking place in cognitive science, mind science, psychology, computer science, and so on. This is my topic. So obviously I'm going to borrow a lot of Buddhist ideas. And what I'm going to argue is that the best way to understand these Buddhist ideas are going to, uh, is going to connect them to Western phenomenology. And so I'm going to kind of weave a tapestry in which I'm going to talk about Buddhist views and phenomenology together. And I'm going to try to understand how do these views, whose angle I will explain, relate to or can connect to some of the modern ideas about consciousness. So that's a program for the entire course. That's what I do with my colleague. Uh, we also have uh, st students meditate, so we do a whole kind of things. But basically, that's what we are trying to do in this course, when, in that course, when we teach together. And that's what I'm going to try to do uh, this time. Okay. Do, do we need to just mention what phenomenology is? No. We're no, we, we're going to come back. So today, I'm going to talk about attention. And this is going to be a way for me to motivate you to understand what is the problem of consciousness. And then next time, we'll start talking about phenomenology and how uh, we can weave together to Western phenomenology and Buddhist, some Buddhist view to obtain interesting descriptions of consciousness from the first person perspective. That will be next time. So next time, I will base my lecture on this book, The Phenomenological Mind. Uh, now, this book is hard going, but it's going to basically do the job that we want to do, which is to connect phenomenology and cognitive science. And uh, I will add Buddhism in the mix, and then we'll be uh, uh, home free 
to try to uh, understand uh, a little bit more about what is the problem of consciousness. Okay? As always, when I lecture, I like if you have questions, you can raise them. If they are directly relevant to what I said, if you are not directly relevant, then maybe you want to wait uh, uh, for the end of the lecture. Anyway, thank you for coming so many. I hope uh, people will keep coming. I hope it's not going to be like Sanskrit. When Sanskrit is taught at the university, you have 15 people starting, and then you end up with a class of one or two. But, <laughs> you know, that's, that's a problem we face. But hey, there are tougher problems in life. OK, so I'm going to talk about two views of consciousness in relation to attention. And the question is going to be, is consciousness the same as attention or not? So there are going to be two views. One I'm going to call it uh, the bottleneck view. And then the second is going, I'm going to call it the phenomenal field view. So, for example, this quote from William James, William James, great American philosopher. Uh, basically, the ancestor of what we are doing here, uh, one of the first person to develop a systematic attempt to study consciousness and the mind in uh, the West. Before that, obviously, you have a lot of uh, philosophy, philosophers who have done that, but basically, William James is one of the founders of cognitive science, and this is what he says about attention. Attention is a taking possession by the mind in clear and vivid form of one out of what seems several simultaneously possible object or train of thoughts. Focalization, concentration of consciousness are of its essence. It implies withdrawal from the same things in order to deal effectively with others, and as a condition which has real opposite in the confused, dazed, and scatterbrained state, which in French is called distraction. Okay, so. Distraction. I'm uh, reading okay. in French. That's what William James said. So, <laughs> okay. So, uh, the idea here that I get is that basically, for William James and a whole bunch of thinkers, consciousness equal attention. Right. Consciousness, we are conscious of something in as much as we attend to that something. Right? Therefore, consciousness here means attention. And that's what I am going to call the bottleneck uh, view of Consciousness. This term comes from one of the reading. This is Wayne Wu's uh, book on attention. It's probably the best book on attention right now. And I selected some of the chapters that are relevant to what we are doing here. And this is what he has on page 176 and 77. Yeah, attention. Oh, sorry. Did I say bottleneck? No, 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 no. Sorry. It's not bottleneck, it's gatekeeper. gatekeeper. Yeah, it's better. George? Yeah? Is attention the same thing as awareness? Well, we'll talk about that. Let's talk first what attention is, right? So there is one view which says consciousness is attention because we are conscious of whatever we are attending to, right? 
that's what I call the gatekeeper view. What is the gatekeeper of consciousness? It's attention. Whatever is it in consciousness is what is, has been processed, and that's what attention does. Okay? Then there is another view which I'm going to embrace and develop in this course, which I call the phenomenal field view. This is a term I just invented today, so don't take this term <laughs> seriously. <laughs> which is a view that basically there is more to consciousness, there is more in consciousness than what we attend to. That consciousness is more than what we pay attention to. So there are two views of consciousness. One says consciousness is what we are attending to because to be conscious is to attend that something. And then there is the other view which says no, there is more to consciousness than we, what we attend to. And then, obviously, the challenge of that second view is going to be try to explain or describe what is this more. And that's where the rubber meets the road. And yeah, we're not there yet. OK, so first, let's think about that. What is attention? OK. So, maybe this is the time. What is the tension? In cognitive science, most people define attention as selection. Attention is selection of an object. Okay? So maybe now is the time to show. Okay the video. Okay, we're going to show a very brief video because uh, our course here has been sponsored by somebody, so we're going to show the advert for our sponsor. <laughs> uh, you don't need to get up, just kind of, I know you can't see very well, it's a light room. Well, not quite. But did the attention seem designed? To test just how much attention the attention stealing design of the new Skoda Fabia actually steals, we left one parked on this ordinary road in West London. We wanted to see if its sharp crystalline shapes, bold lines, and lower, wider profile would attract the desired level of attention. Will the 17 inch black alloy wheels stop passers by in their tracks? Will the angular headlights attract the attention of other road users? Will a crowd gather to check out its fresh, sporty look? Well, not quite. But did the attention-stealing design distract you from noticing that the entire street has been changing right before your very eyes? Don't believe us? Have another look. Did you spot the van changing to a taxi? How about the scooter changing to a pair of bicycles? Or the lady holding a pig? Let alone the fact that the entire street is now completely different. Didn't think so. So there we have it. Proof that the new Skoda Fabia is truly attention. <laughs> okay. So, now you understand a little bit better what this meant by selection, right? Now, for example, uh, in that video, there is this greenhouse, right? Now, you would think it hits you in the eyes, right? And yet, I didn't notice it has changed until they show the after and before. So, what that shows is obviously that when we attend, when we see something, or when we are faced with the scene, we select some features, right? That's what attention 
does. Okay? Attention is selection, and selection is what the features that we select uh, when we are looking, hearing, whatever we are doing, cognitively or affectively. This is called inattentional blindness, right? The most inattention. <laughs> the most famous video that probably many of you have seen is a gorilla video. Ever? Who has seen that video? If you have not seen it, well, um, should I tell them the story or should I t ask you? Okay. It's a great video which, in which you are told to, uh, you're told that you're going to see people playing basketball and you something like that, and you're told that it's very important that you count the number of passes that one team makes. And then they're going to play the video, and in that video, what, you're going, what is going to happen is that in the background, but very visible, a gorilla, somebody disguised as a gorilla is going to walk by. They're not disguised. <laughs> well, they are disguised. It's not a real gorilla, right? <laughs> okay. Now, why is this interesting? Well, because about 50% of the people who are shown that video don't see the gorilla. Now, you don't believe that, right? But, and now I told you, if you look at the, this is why I, I, I spoiled the video for you, because now you cannot go back to that video and see whether you see the gorilla or not. But roughly 50% of the people don't see the gorilla. And the gorilla is not small. It's like, it's a real gorilla. It's walking among, among the players. You would think it's impossible to miss him. And yet about 50% of the people who are shown that video miss, miss him. Now, uh, most cognitive science experiments are done with undergraduates. So it's a particular population. And I, I'm not sure what the numbers would be with other people. But basically, you get the gist, which is that actually we don't see really things as they are, but we see by selecting certain features that we attend to, right? Now, from a Buddhist perspective, that should make perfect sense, right? Um, the kind of Buddhism that I'm talking about is mostly borrowed from the Yogacara tradition. <laughs> which I think has the most, what I think is the most interesting views on the mind, but I think many other traditions offer interesting insight into the mind, and they all uh, agree to argue that we don't really see things as they are, but we construct our own world of experience. Uh, and here we have a good example uh, from cognitive science about how that construction operates because you f we think that we are going to see things as they are, but actually we make a selection and attend the features which we think are relevant or salient, right? And so we see from co this example, very simple example in cognitive science, how actually, yes, we do construct our world of experience and how attention is an important element in that construction. Okay? Okay, so we select. Now, there are many questions about uh, selection. Does it happen early, later? Is it voluntary, involuntary, and so on? But let me ask you, why do we select? Too much information otherwise. Okay. 
Yes? Conditioning. Conditioning. Uh, meaning, if we were not conditioned, we would not select? You said if your particular family has reared you in a certain way, you're going to be focusing on certain things. Okay, that's more how we select rather than why we select, right? Hunting. What? Hunting. Hunting? Mm. <laughs> Tell me more. Well, when we go back into times. So we are together with Lucy, right? Yeah. And what do we do? So, so again, so hunting. Oh, so if, you're, if you're hunting an animal, then you need yeah. to... Lucy, you know, is one of the prime uh, first example of what do you say, hominid? It's not yeah. uh, Homo sapiens, yes, but yeah, keep going. So, to identify a handle in the trees where there's lots of background noise and you need to pick out specific. Okay. 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 Yes? Interest. I remember oh, that's... giving the example once that if you were a telephone repairman, and you drove down the street, <laughs> you would see telephone poles. You uh -huh. ignore pretty much everything else, but your in major interest, because of whatever your lifestyle was, was you would focus on that. So okay. when you're holding a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but that's more like Clifton, how we select, right? What I'm asking is why we select. We have two different answers. Yes, please. Priority. Uh, can you say more? You select things that is most important to you. At that okay. That goes in a way to a little bit. Can you repeat what she said? Yeah, but you select what is most important, relevant, right? To you at that moment. And that goes. So, so why do you do that? So that goes a bit with what Prapandit was saying, because of limited cognitive capacities, right? Is that what you would say? Because we have limited capacities and we cannot attend to everything, right? Yes? Yeah, human beings, uh, specifically, they're geared towards uh, survival, appropriation. Okay. Any reason. That's Still not obvious, but there is a direct link between that and the fact that we select, right? Okay. Any other? Yes? Maybe you should only impetus. I feel by the steam or something. Ah, I really want to attend to that. Yes. So that's, in a way, what... You were saying, right? What is most salient or most relevant in the moment, right? Did you want to? He's saying that it directs your actions. Yeah, that's what. Sorry, I have no idea what your names are, but I'm terrible with names anyway. So, but yes. Yes? I was going to say accent, but accent in the moment. Action, action okay, good. Yes? George, I don't think we select at all, do we? It's not something volitional. It just happens. Uh, selection might be volitional or non-volitional. So if it's non-volitional. If it's non-volitional, it's selection nevertheless. You remember the video, right? The video, we select certain features. It's not, in this case, we don't, uh, sometimes we select voluntarily, right? There, there is top-down selection and bottom-up selection, right? So top-down selection is what we may decide to attend to. Uh, that's one example. Here was an example of a bottom-up selection. We did, I mean, I, when I was watching this video, I did not intend to... I didn't have any particular attention. I was just drawn by certain features, right? That's a selection, it's a kind of automatic bottom-up selection. So there's intentional attention and non-intentional attention. Yes. And there is bottom-up versus top-down. For example, if you're reading the book, you are giving deliberate attention to the book. Yeah. But if somebody calls your name while you're reading, they are then taking your attention. 
That's right. Or in meditation, right? Yeah. In shamatha, you are uh, focusing your attention on the object, right? That's a clear example of a top-down selection, right? The video would be a good example of a, a bottom-up selection, right? Do you want to add something? Uh, no, well, uh, along with hunting, I'm kind of mentioning it comes to threat analysis, so selecting for threats in your environment. Selecting for, okay, yeah, that's all connect to the idea of action, right? So the early idea uh, uh, about attention, uh, uh, research attention, uh, had we basically this idea of, uh, this is where I made the mistake, a bottleneck. Attention is a kind of bottleneck, meaning we have limited cognitive capacity and therefore we need to limit the input of what we get into our mind, right? That was the early idea. This is the work of broadband and the dichotic listening where they put with headphones on and, and then they run various sounds and then they try to see how you, s what you are build, able to attend to and what you are not. And this is a good example of limited capacity, right? But I think many of you were absolutely right that there is more to selection than uh, just limited capacity, right? One of the ways in which attention is very important is for action. So, for example, in the reading, Jesse Prince talked about how attention is connected to working memory that allows you to act, right? Now, what's working memory? By working memory, suppose you are doing a a kind of multiplication in your head and you're holding 67 multiplied by 27 and you're doing this mentally, the memory that allows you to do that kind of work is what is called working memory. Okay? So when your Bangkok taxi driver is texting his girlfriend and driving the car, <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's the working memories. That's the yes, indeed, and that's a problem, right? <laughs> and that's a problem because the working memory should be on the road, and it's in the it's in the phone. So, working memory is what allows you to act when you're not acting spontaneously, when you're following a plan of what to act when you're hunting, for example. Uh, so one way to understand uh, selection is to think about how selection helps us to act, right? Uh, there is a question. Yeah. So he brought up. We, we're not yet done. I know. This we're. <coughs> yeah. So my question is: He brought up this very manly example. So when men are out hunting animals, I want to raise the other example of, uh, say, somebody, let's say a mother, looking after a child. Yeah. But the mother is doing stuff. Mm hmm But then suddenly she realizes she hasn't heard her child for the last 15 minutes or 10 minutes. Mm hmm And it sets an alarm bell. Yeah. So is she attending to her child at that time or not? You mean when the alarm bell rings? Well, before, while she's doing stuff, but she's obviously got one part of her mind on what her child is doing. Yeah. Is that in attention or not in attention? Yeah, it is. It is. Now, yeah, it is. Uh, another way to think about attention is whatever uh, the mind is processing, right? So. Now, a more interesting question is whether what is happening to her thinking about her child when she's not explicitly thinking about the child, uh, right? She's working on her email. Yes, yes, or yes. But there must be some part of her that is exactly. But she's not consciously attending. No. 
and so the question is this attention or is this care for her baby, for example, is it in her consciousness or not, right? Yeah. Okay, so uh, the two views that I've talked about so far uh, belong to this category, right? What I call the gatekeeper category, which says consciousness is basically defined by whatever we pay attention to. Attention is selection, and selection is done for a couple of reasons. One is limited capacity, but the other is for the sake of action, right? And that's a very good understanding because obviously we do want to understand uh, consciousness from a natural selection point of view, right? Our view of consciousness has to be compatible with, if we want, this is what the whole exercise in a way is going to be, trying to provide a view of consciousness that is both compatible with Buddhism and with the modern scientific point of view, right? And from the modern scientific point of view, obviously evolutionary considerations are of primary importance. There is no way to understand uh, ourselves as biological being outside, in a scientific way, outside of an evolutionary perspective, right? And obviously, we have to think about consciousness as well as why, what role did, did it play in evolution? Obviously, this is highly speculative, but it helps us to try to understand what is consciousness for, right? Not in this kind of mystical way and so on, but just exactly the way that you laid out, which is just, oh, you two, survival, right? Uh, we are beings who are trying to survive, and so the question, obviously, is how consciousness helps us to survive, right? The answer, obviously, has to be in part uh, the connection between consciousness and attention, and uh, action, sorry. So consciousness and attention are obviously closely con connected, and one way to understand what consciousness is for is that it helps us to act in the world. Hence, your good example about hunting, right? So my question is, can you be, can you attend to something you're not conscious of, and can you be conscious of something you're not attending to? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what an example of can you attend something you're not conscious of would be deep priming. Okay. Uh, deep priming is, uh, <laughs> if you're given a, a test of choosing, um, for example, you see pictures uh, of people and you have to choose immediately whether they are good or bad. It turns out that uh, if you're fed certain words before you make the choice, these words are going to influence your choice. Like you're fed world like, uh, I don't know, criminal, uh, uh, violent, and so on, if you're fed certain word, uh, they're going to influence your choice. That's what's called deep priming. And a lot of uh, some of the things done in advertisement is, they, is based on these psychological findings of deep priming, that is that our choices can be influenced by things we are not aware at all, we have been fed, but we're not aware that we have been fed. So that would be, in a way, one example of, you could say, would be attention without consciousness, right? Mm -hmm. The other consciousness without uh, attention, well, that's, let's keep this for this view, right? But, yes. 
inattentive cognition, for example, maybe one example in which you may have attend sorry, consciousness without attention. Is, yes? Is, is, dream, is dreaming consciousness without attention? Oh, no, no. Look, is dreaming consciousness without attention? No, it's not. I, 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 you, because there is selection in, in dreaming, right? You're attending certain objects and so on. Dreaming is a, is a great example uh, to keep in mind when we talk about consciousness, because uh, to understand more of this view about consciousness, which I'm going to push throughout this course, we, what is important is to have as broad a view possible of consciousness. And so we should not live, restrict our idea of consciousness to kind of fully awake consciousness, right? Okay, that's a form of consciousness, but then there is a whole gradation of consciousness from the f most fully awake state to less awake, to dream, to maybe deep sleep, hypnosis, all these are very interesting states and we should keep them uh, in, in our mind when we talk about consciousness and avoid to be constrict, limited to consciousness in the fully awakened state, right? That's how you call it, conscious scale? Yeah, I like that, but... Well, yeah. that's what we're calling it today. Yeah, that's good. I like the term. Oh, spectrum is one word that we use. Spectrum, yes. Oh, spectrum, okay. Well, scale would be great if there would be a measurement, right? <laughs> So I just have a question. So yes, please. We're talking about spectrums of consciousness. Yes. And, um, what a human viewpoint we're talking about here. But we oh, we, we, we're only talking about the human. Yeah, but I mean, we're talking about a, a body with animals too. So well, and phenomenal field. Yeah, okay. We'll talk more about animal. Maybe keep this question when we talk more in detail about phenomenology. I'm very interested, oops, I hope I haven't messed up the, okay. it's okay? Uh, it's very interesting, I'm very interested in, in uh, animal cognition, as you know, there's a great deal of work that is happening now, and I think it, the view that I have of consciousness is greatly helped by thinking about consciousness, not just as a human phenomenon, but as, a, as including animals. Obviously in Buddhism you would include more extraordinary things, but that's always delicate to go there. But certainly we should be as broad as possible. And this is also why meditation is an interesting uh, testing ground for consciousness studies, because uh, it uh, offers some mental states which are all out of the ordinary of what normal cognitive scientists are used to consider. And that's why uh, meditation is part nowadays of consciousness studies. There is a, a, a society for consciousness studies. Uh, it's meeting in Tucson, Arizona. Uh, it's well, it's a bit uh, wishy-washy because you have really serious scientists and then Deepak Chopra in the same room, and that's not always obvious what's going on and so on. But uh, welcome to the field of consciousness studies uh, where there is a lot of things to do. And yeah, we're trying different things, and I think it's important to keep as broad a spectrum as possible. Any more question? Yes? So just as a gatekeeper view then, it's sounding quite nonverist. I mean, it's, it seems to be dealing with mainly volitional acts of attention and this, your current state of awareness. Well, maybe, maybe not, because uh, often in the, if you think about the Abhidharma, uh, like the idea of uh, vinyana, right, vinyana, 
uh, which I guess I would translate here as cognition, right? Eye, eye, eye cognitions, uh, ear cognition, and so on. This is very much kind of object-directed understanding of consciousness, right? And so if you think that way, that view would be actually quite in sync with this uh, gate, what I call the gatekeeper view, right? That is this idea that you can understand consciousness basically by understanding the kind of object that we are attending to, right? Can I interject that? Please. Uh, we so two words in Pali, in the Abhidhamma actually, was uh, vitaka and vitara. And vitaka is supposed to be like a bee seeing the flower, and will head towards the flower. And vitara is like a bee circling around the flower. So this was the two main terms for attention uh, in certainly Abhidhamma to Sangaha, yeah. uh, where you will see something go towards it, and keep yourself hovering around it. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you get vijnana, which is specific knowing of the object. Yeah. yeah. I, I just, I'm just not sure what the metaphor is. Gatekeeper, what's the metaphor? Metaphor is attention is the gatekeeper. So con here, the consciousness is determined by whatever we attend to. The other view is that consciousness is more than we, what we attend to. Okay? So you have, let me, this is, maybe this will help. There is, if you have done the reading. <laughs> okay. So do you want to reproduce this? What do you mean, reproduce it? This one is fine. Do you mean read it out? No, uh, on the oh, blackboard. Okay. So there is a common sense model and there is a gatekeeper model. Yeah. So common sense model has yeah. perceptual processing. Consciousness, attention, okay? That's the second view, the phenomenal field view, so right? this one here. Yeah. Maybe we should have started with the other one, but that's okay. And then there is the gatekeeper view, which has Perceptual processing, uh, attention, consciousness. That's a two model. So the gatekeeper views basically talks about how to understand consciousness in terms of the object we are attending to, right? Now, oppose this to this other view, which is the view that I will embrace in this course, because that's a view uh, of the phenomenological tradition, and that's a view which has some roots in the Buddhist tradition, which is what I call the phenomenal field view, meaning perceptual processing, consciousness, and then attention is a function of consciousness rather than consciousness being a function of attention. So this... Really explain what phenomenology is. Uh, we, we, we will do it next time. Okay. That's okay. We'll, today we'll, we'll explain what the word phenomenal is, so I will explain that. But what I want people is to get clear the two views, right? First view is this gatekeeper view. I didn't choose the term, that's what this reading does. Se second is a phenomenal field view, which is that <coughs> consciousness is more than what we attend to. So the second view is committed to what is sometimes called the overflow view, the overflow thesis, 
What is the overflow thesis? It's the view that there is more in consciousness than what we attend to. Okay? So, for example, uh, <laughs> there is a lot of debate in cognitive science about how rich is our phenomenal visual field. Okay? Now you think, crazy. It's rich. I see everything, right? That's what you think, right? <laughs> is it? You think like, what is this guy talking about? <laughs> well, it turns out <coughs> that if you look at how what is actually directly processed by the eye, you have a, pheno a field which is about as broad as this one, as this. Very, very narrow field. And yet we seem to think, we seem to have the experience of this kind of broad phenomenology of vision, right? This broad idea, this idea, this kind of impression that we have that the world is displayed around us in all its richness, right? Okay? And yet when we look at what the eye is actually able to process, I'm not sure it's that big or maybe slightly bigger, but it's pretty narrow. So what is happening? Well, that's what we are talking about. Now, in the second view, the phenomenal field, it argues that simply, yes, we have this rich phenomenology and we, we have this impression, this experience of having a, a rich uh, apprehension of the world, and we do because there is more in consciousness than what we are attending to, right? This is what we are attending to, but consciousness is including a lot more than what we are attending to. Now, don't think there is anything mystical. Or, no, 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 no. This is not anything we're talking. We're not talking about mysticism. We're just talking about the fact that what we are really directly processing is pretty narrow. But because consciousness is able to retain a lot of information, it is producing this impression that I have of this vast uh, rich experience, and we are going to talk about in the third class how that is done, at least from a phenomenological perspective. Yes? Is the seven plus or minus two thing from George Miller coming in? What's that? The seven plus or minus two thing, does that come in? Seven plus or minus two, I think it is. It was uh, George Miller talking about the that the conscious mind can only attend to yes, yes. Well, five to nine bits of information. Gatekeeper view. Right. Yeah, right? But then the rest goes into the unconscious. No. Well, okay. For the gatekeeper view, yes. Okay? So I am today laying out two views because I want to put on the table clearly what I'm arguing for and uh, what I'm, uh, and how what I'm arguing for is different from uh, probably the mainstream of cognitive science. And the reason that the mainstream of cognitive science tend to think about uh, consciousness, computation,